Well, happy Father's Day. It's good, it's good to be here. It's good that you are here and to celebrate uh, not only this day, but also to worship God, which is always what these uh, gatherings are about, right? To just give our attention to him. I told you last week that I was going to have the privilege of uh, baptizing uh, last Sunday in the, in the afternoon at his home, a man with terminal illness who had just late in life come to receive Jesus Christ into his life as Lord and Savior. And so I just want to let you know we got that done. And um, it was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And so let me, let me just tell you a little bit. He invited some family members there and then and some extended family. And then he invited, uh, to my surprise, he invited his closest uh, friends who were uh, just, you know, this is all kind of new to them and all. And so unrehearsed, I just said to him before I baptized him, uh, I said to him, I just called, I said, Don, uh, do you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior? He said, like clarity, he said, yes, I do, right? And then I said, is it true that Jesus Christ forgives all of your sins? And he says, yes, it is. Isn't that awesome? And I just, in a moment, I was just like, it was just so clear of what he had done and, and beginning to understand what it meant that now his sins were forgiven, right? He had received Christ as Lord and Savior into his life. Today as we're talking about the matter of being released and what it means that the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within our lives so that we're released from the past and released into the future, released from past failures and sins, our old identity, our old destination, and now brought into our new identity and our new destination, from a, 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 a life that was lived outside of relationship with God where we weren't really acknowledging God at all in our lives, but now we have embraced what Jesus Christ has done for us, and now we have a new, a new relationship with God. That's at the heart of being released. This is empowered then by the Holy Spirit. A personal relationship with Jesus is absolutely essential. I have uh, grandkids who... Uh, are uh, just a delight to me, and I'm called by a number of names, right? Grandpa and Papa, right? Those are the main two. But my, but my in-law kids, we have four married children, and my in-law kids, they call me by a variety of names, right? One, one of them simply calls me David. Uh, you know, you always want to know what your in-laws or kids are going to call you, right? Well, she calls me David. Uh, and I love when she calls me David because the relationship is there, uh, I, she says it with affection. I, uh, I love that relationship with this, with this daughter-in-law. My, another daughter-in-law calls me the father. <laughs> or father. Father. <laughs> or the father said this. I go, it's, to me, it's just really funny, but it's her own special way of relating to me. She calls me the father, right? I have, uh, my new son-in-law calls me papa, Right? So uh, oh, I'll take that. That feels warm. Doesn't that feel right? And then uh, my, uh, my other son-in-law, he calls me Abba. He, he calls me Abba, which is the Old Testament, New Testament. New Testament word It's an Aramaic word, it kind of uh, that means daddy. He, he calls me Abba. It is the same name that Jesus used to address his Father in heaven, and it's what we are taught that, that God is our Abba Father. Not everybody knows that. When I was, uh, when I was 18 years old, and between my, uh, my freshman year and sophomore year in college, um, I, um, I had a particular moment when I was deeply impressed to pray for my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, my dad's dad, who had no relationship with Jesus Christ that, that we could see at all. He had been raised in a, a home where Christ was believed. I'm not sure all that happened in his life, but, but he had decided somewhere along the line that it wasn't really for him. Um, I don't know what that was about. He was a man of the world, truly, in the, the broadest sense of the world. He had money, he had popularity, he had prestige, he had possessions. Um, he, um, he was a good man in a lot of ways, but he just had no, no real personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And when I was 18 years old, I was particularly impressed on one occasion to really pray for him. 
which wasn't often because really in previous times when anybody would share about Jesus to him, he just simply laughed it off, you know, and it kind of made you f not feel like sharing it with him very much. But I prayed for him, and, 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 and because it was such an unusual uh, time, I, I called my dad and I said, I just want to tell you, I prayed for Grandpa. I, I was concerned about him, and I just prayed for salvation. And, and she, he said, well, you ought to call him because he's in the hospital, and tomorrow he has surgery. I had no idea. He was 67 years old at that time. And so, uh, so I, I, you know, with fear and trepidation, you know, I called my grandfather and I just, hi, Grandpa, I just like uh, wanted to tell, you know, how you doing, what's happening, you know, and he was going to have this surgery. And, and I, I said to him, I said, um, well, I just want to let you know that I, I, tonight I really prayed for you and I want you to know how much God loves you. And he didn't laugh it off, he didn't dismiss it, he just simply said, thank you, which was huge. We hung up. He had surgery the next day. And the next day after that, he died from a hemorrhage. Totally unexpected. We were so, uh, I was so glad <laughs> that I had prayed for him. I was so glad that I had called my own father to tell him. I was so glad he said, encouraged me to call him and talk to him, which I did. Um, I was so thankful. It, it's, it's just in that little window there that we have this, uh, I mean, God knows all things, right? We don't, we don't know all things, but we know that in that little window there might have been this, this moment where he began to open his life up to God in some different way, some saving way. And we know that if you open your life to God just a bit, God comes flooding in, <laughs> He doesn't say it's not open enough. I think he just sees this openness and he goes, I'll take that, right? Um, because you see, the whole matter of being released from the past and, and released into the future, the whole matter of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is, is, is really at the heart of what it means to, to live a release, a free and a, a fearless life. And we're called to that. We're, we're given that by God in Jesus Christ. And it is animated in us. It's brought to life. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like breath and wind uh, bringing life to a valley of dry bones, right? It's like dust of the earth being animated into a living soul when God's spirit breathes into us. Not only did it happen with God and man at the very beginning, but it, it happens now when we are born again into God through Jesus Christ. The spirit of God breathes life into us. I want to read a text to you, and then, and then I want to talk to you about a little, little bit about the, the, you know, the whole thing of the absent, the absent father or, the, or the, the experience in our culture of, of the absence of father. We all experience it, don't we? We all have experienced it to some degree, which I'll explain in a moment. The text today, so that we can understand that, that we can actually be, uh, you know, ready, you know, just be released and, and all. Uh, the text today is, is in... Uh, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses, uh, let's see, verses 14 through 17. And, and what I'm going to do later, I'm just going to read it now, but later we'll, we'll go through each of these verses a little more carefully because I want you to get this. This is absolutely some of the best news in the whole world to us. But Romans chapter, Romans chapter 8 uh, reads like this, beginning with verse 14. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him, by this Holy Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in in his glory. I'd like for us to pray because I know that there's no way that we're going to understand this unless God opens our hearts and minds. So please understand that this morning is not about clever speech and good sermons. This morning is about the Holy Spirit revealing God to you. Let's pray. 
Father, we all understand what it is to live in a fatherless uh, society, uh, imperfect fathers, imperfect fathers we have had, though many of them good fathers, imperfect fathers we are, though we try to be the best we can be. Lord God, I pray that you would open our hearts to what we need to know about you, about our relationship with you, and about who we are with you. Through Jesus Christ, our King of endless glory, we pray these things. Amen. Amen. I remember when uh, Ed Bjorik taught about the fatherhood of God, and I remember so well when I first heard this, how he began. When he began to talk about our experiences of God, or our experience of how our experiences of God often reflect our experiences of earthly fathers until the Holy Spirit begins to do something fresh and new within us. He, he talked about uh, our experience of fathers as, as, um, as passive. So we, we, many of us perhaps have experienced passive fathers. The passive father is the one who is, uh, for various reasons, he is not engaged with his family. He's not engaged with his children. He uh, is, is perhaps emotionally withdrawn. Perhaps he's a closed book. Perhaps he is a father who just doesn't take any time to be present to his children. I remember years ago a study was done about the amount of time that fathers spend with their children. I, came, I think it came to something like uh, undivided attention, 27 seconds a week. Um, you know, this is not like undivided. This is not saying, hey, do this. Hey, clean up your room, which I became very good at, right? You know, how come you didn't do the lawn, right? I told you to do this, blah, blah, blah. And this is how we relate, right, all around, all around these facts or these demands and all. But really uh, personal attention, like, like getting on your knees, eyeball to eyeball with them and just asking them, how are you? <laughs> Tell me something about your day. Sometimes fathers are passive because they're just absent. Sometimes they're absent because a divorce happened a long time ago. Or perhaps they're absent because they died. And so through no fault of their own, the experience of father is one of absence. Or, be, or maybe through no fault of their own, their own, they have a job that takes them away. Uh, long periods of time. It's hard. It's, it's hard. And it's not evil. It's just hard. And it is like sometimes this, this passive father can be the experience. It doesn't always have to be experienced in that case, but often is. So he talked about the passive father. And if we've had this kind of experience of God, our, uh, of our earthly father, then God our father, we will tend to see as the, 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 the God who's not really particularly engaged in our lives. You understand how, how that can come about, this association, right? And then, and then, there is the, uh, then there's the performance father. Uh, this, is, this is the father that... that um, that, that rewards you with his love if you do well. This is the father who gives his love and his affection to you if you have pleased him. If you have, you know, he's, he's the father that if you get a B, he says, where was the A, right? Or if you get an A, he says, where was the A plus? Um, or the father who, who is cold toward you if you messed up. The father who uses the giving of affection as a way of controlling the relationship rather than uh, just giving you affection even on your worst days. Um, sometimes if we've experienced our earthly fathers as this, then we believe, and this is, pre this is pervasive in the church of Jesus Christ, we believe that God is a performance-oriented father so that if you do well, then you receive the reward of his affection and if you don't do very well then you can't expect him to be talking to you after all you haven't done well and that's a very difficult way to live uh, it's kind of interesting uh, I grew up in the era of the church of Jesus Christ when this performance thing was very very high and even though I had a father who wasn't a performance oriented father I lived in a church that was a performance oriented church and everything was all around pleasing him and uh, you weren't really sure if you did because he's holy and perfect and you're not. And then the other father uh, experience was 
really devastating is the punitive father. This, this is the father who punishes you. He told the story about a, a, a boy who was being taught woodworking by his father. And his father was a master craftsman. And he was, he was uh, great at carving and, and all. And so he was teaching his son how to do it. And, and his son was learning. And his son made a, made a misstep and, and nicked the piece of wood. And his father hauled off and just slapped him across the face like that. So the punitive father. If you grew up like that, then the chances are that there's a lot of healing that has to be done in your life because God is perceived often like that, that he's angry and you better watch your step, right? Because uh, he, he, he has the last word and the last word may not be a very good word for you if you don't do well. And none of these experiences are endearing. Like there's a there's a sense in which it's very hard to build an intimate, healthy relationship with a God who is like this. And a lot of times what happens is, is that our, our experience of uh, imperfect fathers, you know, imperfect fathers, uh, these, this experience right here can affect very much how we see God, as I've been saying. But there's other elements that go in because I had really, uh, I had a really a good father. He wasn't a perfect father, but but he really he wasn't this. And so I'm I'm very thankful. But I've just needed so much healing in my own life because not only are there imperfect fathers, but 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 there is just our own fallenness, right? Like like our own alienation and brokenness as a human race, that we're just broken in this relationship with God. And that's, that's why Jesus came, is to restore, right? To reconcile, to bring us back into a relationship with God. There's the fallenness, there's the, you know, and then if you combine with that the imperfect fathers, and then you put upon that a, a phrase that, are used, that is used to describe Satan, he is called the father of lies, <laughs> There's the father of lies. So there's the line of the evil one, the line of the devil, of Satan himself, who loves to lie to you about who God is. And he loves to lie to you about who you are. Right? So when you combine all of this, then you can just see that we're, we're set up for some... <laughs> this is... We need some help, right? This would be a good time to shake your head yes, because I cannot tell what you're thinking. We need some help. Um, I was uh, really impressed by some phrases I read about about our our uh, fatherless society or our experience of of, of this. Uh, let me just share a little bit of it because to me it's just absolutely powerful. When God, as the Holy Spirit, is missing, th there's no intermomentum. There, there's no inner corrective. There's no inner aliveness that keeps us from dying from our wounds. See, in, unless God does something, we're just going to die from our wounds. We're going to be constantly thwarted by our wounds, tripped up by, by the wounding that's happened. When, when God as Father is missing or is seen largely as threatening or punitive, there is a foundational scariness and insecurity to our whole human journey. Fear and competition dominate more than love. It's not a safe universe. It's not a benevolent universe. There's a terrorist God behind every rock, and I've got to protect my life because no one else will. I am not inherently participating, nor do I intrinsically belong. Life is framed in a win-lose paradigm. If God is not for you, then it's all on you. Yeah, I mean, that's... Do, do you hear what that is? That if God is not for you, then who is? It's, it's, it's all on you. Good luck with that. And the reason that we learn how to function without God is out of our own woundedness then, and then our view of God, then what happens is that then we decide, well, then I'm just going to do it by myself. And we learn how to live independently, right, of God and his help because he's not reliable anyway, right? 
So when God begins to break in on us through Jesus Christ and begins to tell us something different, there, there is set loose a whole new revolution, right? When the love of God is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, something begins to move. Something begins to change. Now this is the great gift of God to us in the Holy Spirit. And these are the verses I want to unpack for us just for a moment, okay? So, so in breaking up, Breaking up this, you know, breaking up this awful combination, you know, of, 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 of brokenness, there, there is what God does in Jesus Christ. So let's just, let's look through this for a moment. This is, this is our need for the Holy Spirit. Let's just take these verses uh, one at a time. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. Now, this verse is powerful because it, it tells us that the Holy Spirit of God is doing something within us as people who, who belong to God, that we are, we are the children of God. I, I like how one translation puts it, the mature children of God are those who are moved by the impulses of the Holy Spirit. Or as one translation says, it, as God, the Spirit of God is leading you, then you take comfort in knowing that you are His children. The Spirit of God beckons and there are things to do and places to go. That those who are led by the Spirit of God. This just tells us this. That, that God in giving you the Holy Spirit is, is giving you a, a deep inner counsel. An influencer. When you let the Spirit of God influence, influence you then it just confirms over and over again that you are the children of God, that you belong to God. I, I just love it that God doesn't remain aloof. He is near. He is like in you. When you pray for the Holy Spirit to just fill you, you can pray two things. I pray Holy Spirit be in me and Holy Spirit be upon me. In fact, when you look at throughout the scriptures, you'll, you'll find this, particularly in the New Testament, that and in the Old Testament, the, uh, the Spirit upon. It's like the Spirit within is God within you, producing the fruit of the Spirit of love and joy and peace. God within you, the Spirit within you, does something that, that from the inside out. right? And the Spirit upon you is like the Spirit of God empowering you, like for witness and for, and for boldness and for courage and for obedience. Right? It's just so good. A lot of times I'm saying, God, I just the Holy Spirit, just fill me because I need you in me. I need your love, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your goodness, your self-control, right? And sometimes I'm going into a situation, I say, God, I need you upon me. <laughs> I need you to anoint my life. I need you to anoint me with power, with yourself, because I need to be courageous right now. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit is given to us. So why? So that we, we, we are those who are being led by the Spirit. Let yourself be led, okay? Look, look, this is what God wants to do within your life. Let yourself be led. You know, don't, don't make it so that God always has to be, you know, <laughs> pulling you. Um, a willing heart is a beautiful thing. A willing heart is a beautiful thing. Just to say to God, I'm, I'm willing. I'm willing. What have you say to me? I'm, I'm, I'm willing. Right? And if you find the battle going on inside, and you're not willing and you're resisting, just like call a timeout. Say, God, can we have a timeout? <laughs> what is going on in here? Why am, I, why am I digging my heels in the ground? Right? Why won't I let you just work in me? What is the deal here? What am I afraid of? And by the way, if you pause like that, time out, God. If you pause like that, he'll, he'll show you. He'll work in your life. Here's this next verse. I love it. So this is the Holy Spirit brings to us, right? The, our, our need for the Holy Spirit is seen within these verses. Verse 15. The Spirit you receive, the Holy Spirit, does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him, by the Spirit, we cry out to God, Abba, Father. Now, this is just beautiful. This is so beautiful. So, what I want you to understand here is that 
When you receive the Spirit of God in you, you didn't receive just another kind of bondage and fear. Did you, do you realize that, that God doesn't want you to live under religious duty and religious obligation? He didn't, he didn't shift you from, from the law of sin and death now to uh, the law of, boy, you better do this right or else. <laughs> That's huge. All the time when I talk to people who find themselves not wanting to follow after God, I usually can tell why they want to after some conversation according to what they believe, who believe about God, who he is. And a lot of times when people are rebelling against God, they're really rebelling against their own caricature of God, their misunderstanding about who God is, right? And, and then when that all comes into clear focus and they still, re oh, okay, that's another issue. But a lot of times when people talk to me, well, God is just angry all the time, I go, well, no wonder. I wouldn't believe in him either if I were you, right? I wouldn't want to follow that. But he's not like that. Jesus came to set right who God is for us. So he's not, or as one translation puts it, and I love this, and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty leading you back into the fear of never being good enough, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance enfolding you into the family of God, and you will never feel orphaned, for as he rises up within us, our spirits join him in saying the words of tender affection, Beloved Father. Man, that's some good news. There's some great news. That, that right there will, will just revolutionize your life. He was, he's given us, this is like the spirit of adoption has come upon us. And so kind of here's what's happening here. So, to, so there's, there's this God, right, at work. And what he has done, he has poured into our lives the Holy Spirit. We'll just put the spirit. And, and this is the spirit of, of adoption. So we are included into God's family. And as a result of this, we can address God as Abba, Abba, Father. And the relationship, it, it, everything has changed. And everything begins to change and keeps growing and changing. The spirit of adoption. He has given to us the spirit of adoption. Uh, he has adopted us into his family. I, I just love that. I just, I, and we were not orphaned. Jesus said before he left his disciples, I mean, before he was crucified, I will not leave you as orphans. The fatherless experience in an orphan spirit is often what plagues many people's lives. And that's the reason we're so anxious, we're so driven, we're so untrusting, we're so protective. And that's another reason why the wounds that we have are not healed. Because we can't risk bringing those wounds out into the open with God and with trusted others. I'm really excited. Hi, Jared. I'm so excited about Jared and Stephanie's newly adopted child. Praise the Lord, right? We've been praying for you. And it looks like uh, the baby's not here, but... Uh, I have good evidence that they were telling the truth because I held the baby yesterday, right? And I, I, I would just want to let you know, this is like a beautiful thing to be adopted. And you know, when they adopted a child and when God adopts us, you know, when anybody, I mean, I see here, here, some who have adopted and fostered many. Here, I just, here's, a, here's what you do. As an adoptive parent, you said, I just throw my heart open to you, child, and I give you the permission to make my night sleepless. I give you the permission to make everything a mess. I give you the permission to occupy my time and break my heart and thrill me as well. Right? Isn't that what you do? That's what you've done. You said, I just give you... Right? We often think about what is from our side. Oh, we get to be included. What is it from God's side? What is God saying to us? He's saying, we matter. He's saying, I would, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. The true spirit of adoption. This is what God says. Isn't that awesome? We just think about this. Whereby we can cry now out to God. We've been adopted. And with certainty we can cry out to God. Abba, Father. Which is in the Aramaic. In Jesus' home language. Uh, uh, the word for God that Jesus used. His home dialect. The Aramaic. He said, Abba, Father. 
And he used it in the good times and used it in the hard times. In his most critical moment, when he was facing death on the cross, he was praying to God all by himself, his father. And he says, in the garden of Gethsemane, before he's betrayed by Judas, before he is put on trial, before he is crucified, horribly crucified on a cross, he says to God, Abba, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, this cup of suffering. Even there, he experienced his Abba, the Abba presence of God as he gave his life for us. And Jesus in the Holy Spirit gives us his own priceless relationship with the Father, even in teaching us to pray, our Father in heaven, which Jesus would have translated in his mind, our Abba in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Abba. Oh, Jesus knew God as a, not a terrorist God. Jesus knew God as his Abba, Father, and he would sneak away at night and other times just to spend time with him because wisdom, comfort, strength came from his Abba, Father, flowing into his life from the love that he and the Father shared. This same relationship the Holy Spirit given to us causes us to cry out. The spontaneous is free. Abba, Father. So when I went to Israel uh, a number of years ago, walking through Nazareth, I've told you this before, but through the city of Nazareth, and all of a sudden there's commotion coming out of a house near us and out bounding out of the door are two little boys crawling, Abba, Abba. And I turn around and look at them and they run and jump into the arms of their father who is coming home. And I go, that's it. That's what Jesus was teaching us. When I was in Africa, the little boys called their father. In Zimbabwe, they called them Baba, Baba, Baba. Here they say Papa, Daddy, Dada. It's this intimacy. It's just like how close he wants to be known. Not, not just, not just um, king, and, which he is, and lord, which he is. But guess what? My king, my lord, my Abba. Abba, I belong to you. Would you say that with me? Abba, I belong to you. A prayer I learned from Brennan Manning. Who, who taught us much about the fatherhood of God. Abba, I belong to you. And when I'm anxious and fearful, when I, which I, I, I get there so many times, I can get there so quickly. But the Holy Spirit reminds me, no, shh, <laughs> settle. No, look at me. Remember who I am. Remember who you are. Abba, I belong to you. And I tell you, my friends, this is for you. This is for you and your children. And in Abba Father, in this relationship, in learning this relationship, is the healing of a thousand wounds and the freeing from a thousand strongholds. Amen. I bless you. I bless you to know Abba, Abba Father. I bless you to, to embrace this wild and extravagant gift of Jesus Christ who brings us into relationship with God and then now God pours his Holy Spirit into us whereby we now can cry out to him, Abba Father, this is for you. This is is for you. On your worst days and on your best days, he is never the performance-oriented father. He is never the passive father. He is never the punitive father. He is Abba, Father. To God, whom we now may call Abba, through Jesus Christ and by the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you.
for who you are, for who you are for us. And that since you are for us, who can be against us? And since you are for us, it's not on us. It's not all on us. It's not all about what we can do. It's about our responsive love to you. It's about saying yes. It's about trusting. It's about letting the relationship flourish and grow. So that what happens between the age of 6 and 60 or younger and older, what happens in all of that of life will not need to make us bitter, protective, fearful, but instead invites us into freedom and joy to share in both the hard times and in the good times with Jesus Christ. Thank you, our Father. Thank you, our Abba. As we sing the song, which uh, most of you may know, just somewhere during the song, just say to God, Abba, I belong to you. All right? Begin to form the words. Begin to let yourself say them. It is for you. Amen. Let's stand, shall we? He's a good, good father.